Okay, we're live. Sergeants, if you could begin your recording. Backup is rolling. PC recording is going, waiting on cloud. Cloud's going. Sergeant Leonardo, I'll leave it to you. Thank you. Good morning and welcome to the New York City Council remote hearing on the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. At this time, we ask that all council members and council staff turn on their video for verification purposes. Please place all cell phones and electronic devices to silent or vibrate. If you wish to submit testimony, you can do so by sending it to testimony at council.nyc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.nyc.gov. We thank you for your cooperation. Chair, we are ready to begin. Thank you, Sergeant. Um, okay. Thank you for joining our virtual hearing today on the eighth anniversary of Superstorm Sandy. Uh, my name is Councilman Justin Brennan. I'm the chair of the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. Um, I want to acknowledge Council Member Debbie Rose, who has joined us so far uh, for today's hearing. Um, and I'm going to now turn it over to Committee Council uh, Jessica Steinberg Albin, who's going to go over some uh, procedural items before we get started. Thank you. I am Jessica Steinberg Albin, Council to the Resiliency and Waterfronts Committee of the New York City Council. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that you will be on mute until you are called on to testify when you will be unmuted by the host. I will be calling on panelists to testify. Please listen for your name to be called. I will be periodically announcing who the next panelist will be. Before we hear testimony from the administration, we will first have a single person public panel. The first panelist to give testimony will be Dr. William Sweet of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. I will call you when it is your turn to speak. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Thank you. I will now pass it to Chair Brannon to give an opening statement. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Um, good morning, everybody. My name is Justin Brannon, and I have the privilege of chairing uh, the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. I want to welcome you today to the oversight hearing on the eighth anniversary of Superstorm Sandy and the 2020 uh, hurricane season. New York City's 520 miles of coastline are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise, storm surge, and flooding. Areas such as Broad Channel, Hamilton Beach, and Howard Beach already experience monthly tidal flooding. The New York Panel on Climate Change predicts that by 2050, more areas throughout the city will see regular tidal flooding because of sea level rise. Eight years ago this week, Superstorm Sandy devastated the city, inundating areas with seawater, leaving almost 2 million people without power and destroying approximately 300 homes, causing an estimated $19 billion in damages and lost economic activity. Two months ago, Tropical Storm Isaias hit the city with winds up to 78 miles per hour in some parts. This most recent storm left more than 100,000 customers in the city without power, and thousands remained without power up to one week after the storm hit. There is still more than a month left and what has become one of the most active hurricane seasons in history. 
In fact, this past weekend, Hurricane Zeta became the 27th named storm. And yesterday it became the 11th hurricane. So not only are we in the midst of a hyperactive hurricane season, but we're also in the midst of a global pandemic. Communities of color are disproportionately impacted by climate change, sea level rise, and coastal flooding. 28% of NYCHA developments are located in the floodplain. Superstorm Sandy caused almost $2 billion in damage to NYCHA developments, knocking out power, heat, and hot water to 10% of NYCHA properties. 400 buildings had no power, and 386 buildings also had no heat or hot water for weeks. We need real coastal flood protections, and those coastal protections should include both green and gray infrastructure, which is incorporating wetlands, living shorelines, and nature-based features in addition to, or in some areas instead of, seawalls and levees. Last year, we discussed the city's resiliency projects and emergency preparedness. The mayor's office of resiliency testified that four major groundbreakings were to take place in 2020. The Staten Island Coastal Storm Risk Management Project, the Atlantic Side Rockaway Reformulation Project, the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, and lastly, New York State's Living Breakwaters. We look forward to receiving an update from the administration on these projects today and how these projects will be funded and how the funding status of all resiliency projects is progressing in the city's portfolio. As we are about to enter the last month of one of the most active hurricane seasons in recorded history, while also dealing with COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic, we need to know what plans are in place to keep residents and emergency workers safe if they must evacuate. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention and the Federal Emergency Management Agency both recommend that small shelters like hotels, dormitories, and classrooms should be used over traditional large congregate shelters because of COVID. New York City Emergency Management's public guideline states that residents who must evacuate should include hand sanitizer and face coverings in their go bag but their guidance does not include how social distancing will be maintained if residents must evacuate to the various public schools that New York City Emergency Management currently uses as evacuation shelters. So we look forward to hearing uh, their plans and how those plans will be communicated to the public well in advance of the next storm. To ensure that the city is resilient, we must plan and build intelligently now in every borough not just Manhattan. We must continue to incorporate the New York City Panel on Climate Change's projections for sea level rise, precipitation, and future temperatures in the city's future planning efforts. Only then will we will we be able to protect the city's residents, visitors, and property from future storms and the impact on climate change. We can do better and we must do better. It's simply not a choice. I look forward to hearing testimony from the Mayor's Office of Resiliency and New York City Emergency Management and their answers to our questions today about how we are proactively preparing for future storms and not just reacting to them afterwards. I also look forward to hearing from the experts who study sea level rise and coastal flooding issues. Before we begin today, I wanna to thank my committee staff, committee counsel, Jessica steinberg Albin, senior policy analyst, Patrick Mulvihill, senior finance analyst, Jonathan Seltzer, and my senior advisor, Jonathan Yedden, for all their hard work in putting this hearing together. I could not do it without this great team. Uh, I now wanna hand it back over to uh, committee counsel, Jessica steinberg Alman. Thank you. And I would also just like to recognize that council member uh, Ruben Diaz Sr. has joined us as well. We will now call on Dr. William Sweet of the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Agency to testify. Dr. Sweet, you may begin your testimony once you are unmuted. Starting time. Great, uh, good morning. 
can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Sweet. Super. Um, well, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Um, as mentioned, my name is William Sweet. I'm a sea level scientist for the National Ocean Service at NOAA. Uh, I study the tide gauges and help uh, make projections of sea level rise and coastal flood risk uh, changes as they are experienced uh, by communities around the coast, such as, uh, as in New York City and the surrounding region, uh, and help provide you know, guidance for sound decision making. Um, hopefully you all have some slides that I'll be uh, speaking to, uh, and if so, uh, we'll go on to the second slide, please. So I don't need to tell you about uh, the risks and the impacts of sea level rise as they're playing out in your community. Um, you know them as well as any. Uh, it, you're not uncommon in terms of this phenomena. It's an East Coast and Gulf Coast phenomena that's occurring largely right now. Uh, sea level rise is caught up. Um, what we are trying to do is connect sea level rise related flooding to impacts on the ground. And our starting point in the conversation is really the day-to-day -day, uh, uh, impacts that are experienced, whether it's from storms or uh, tides or, or you name it, uh, that are experienced and forecasted by our National Weather Service with conjunction of local emergency managers. So in this uh, image here, taking from a uh, local weather forecast office, sort of gives uh, sort of an illustrious example of what the flooding would look like under various flood severities. And we have sort of used the high tide flooding, which is more minor in consequence, but due to increase in frequency, it's starting to take a toll in many communities as a starting point to really frame the discussion of how has sea level rise affected flood frequencies along the coast. Uh, so this is sort of, yeah, you know, it's a climate meet weather story here. It's local flood defenses as they are that uh, when impacts occur and events are anticipated, uh, you get warned and 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 uh, you know so you can take um, proactive measures to you know either protect your car, your vehicle, or or you know alert your public. But due to climate change, sea level rise, you know these kind of events are increasing in frequency, and this is what I'll speak to uh, and frame much of the discussion today. Moving on to the next slide. An old image of the tide gauge at the battery um, just sort of shows sort of how we collect these water levels. Uh, they've been in existence in this area and, and many others for upwards of a century, um, are really used for you know, uh, safe shipping and navigation, but due to years of sea level rise, they're also informing us of how sea level rise related coastal flooding is changing in nature. And what we've been doing is really just looking at the observation shown in blue, the tide predictions are in white and making counts as to, uh, you know, how many times a year are we crossing these thresholds, which sort of uh, register as sort of minor, moderate or major flooding. And we're simply summing these up and, and discerning patterns and projecting these into the future as a starting point to recognize uh, uh, vulnerabilities and how under current flood defenses uh, impacts may change in the future. Um, so again, sort of that minor high tide flooding is, is about two feet above mean high tide. Um, sometimes you refer to these in geodetics, uh, national, uh, the uh, NAVD88. There's various ways of describing it, and I'll show uh, a couple different ways that we, it can be referred to. But in essence, it's that kind of minor flooding that really probably is playing out in many of these areas around the, the airport and Jamaica Bay area, I think, is sort of your front and center of your impacts, uh, which can be seen on the next slide. These are uh, images that I have just taken off of uh, from some of our weather service uh, media sites showing examples of that October 2016 event where there was, uh, you know, flooding was occurring. It was cold, but water uh, wasn't too high, but it was high enough uh, sort of at that in between moderate, moderate uh, flood stage to cause, you know, very uh, noticeable impacts. And again, what we're trying to do, and I think a lot of the challenge currently is to really understand when water gets to a certain height, where and what are the impacts? Uh, they become very clear at the Hurricane Sandy levels. It's clear as day and it's, it's very catastrophic and significant. But even at the lesser extremes, you know, where is the flooding occurring? What are the impacts? How do we catalog this so you can get a better sense of with rising sea levels, where, what will the consequences be under today's uh, flood defenses? Next slide, please. So a schematic 
basically showing these colorful uh, sort of bell-shaped curves um, that really characterize each curve would represent 365 days per year on average during a decade. Uh, on the x-axis is in, in meters, uh, with, uh, so two feet is about 0.6, sort of showing that high tide flood threshold or more major flooding at four feet. Obviously, Hurricane Sandy levels aren't even on this graph, but it just shows due to the continuous creep of sea level, whether it's ocean rise or land sinking, that the risk of flooding of all severities are increasing. Whereas the four foot flood, the five foot flood might still be in these uh, you know, very low probability, maybe one in 10 or one in 20 or one in 100 type events. The less or extreme, the high tide flooding now are starting to get under that part of the curve where it's something that's happening several times a year. And due to continuous sea level rise, uh, it's becoming very nonlinear in response. And you can see that on the next slide that has the yellow uh, columns, bar columns of number of days per year with a high tide flood. And so the red dotted line is a quadratic fit, just a mathematical fit to the data. If it was linear, it would be a straight line, but it's not. It's quadratic and it's showing that on an annual basis, uh, these lesser extremes, uh, whose images you saw earlier is just a, an example, are now accelerating. They're not expected to slow down. It's expected to increase and continue to increase into the future, uh, growing in depth uh, and, and become more widespread uh, with consequences more severe. Uh, and this is more or less what we are seeing up and down the eastern seaboard right now in many locations. Uh, so it's not necessarily unique, but it's concerning nonetheless. Next slide, please. So here we show in blue are the more likely ranges of sea level rise, relative sea level rise for the New York City region. Uh, not too uh, different than what has been already established somewhat for the New York City region in New York. Um, this is NOAA's 2017 intermediate low and intermediate uh, range shaded in blue. And then black is the observations at the battery's tide gauge uh, as it stacks up. So you can see that it sort of fall on this trajectory that um, looks to be like it's unfolding uh, somewhere at a year 2100 target of somewhere between two and slightly more than four feet of rise by the end of the century. Could be higher. It's very likely not going to be less as sea level rise are modeled and predicted to continue to increase in their rate as to which they are rising. Um, this values, you know, again, consider lots of other things. Land sinking is included in this. Uh, gravitational changes to land, uh, ice melt, and where's ice melting, changes in circulation of the Gulf Stream. It's really what's important for local decision making is what is the projections of likely rise uh, in the place of concern. In this area, it's New York City. Next slide. Uh, this shows some uh, engineering return interval curves or damage risk curves. Uh, uh, loosely. What you see in the dark blue is what FEMA's definition of the 1% annual chance shown as a return interval is 100 years. On both axes, on the Y, you have a NAVD88, which oftentimes maps are used with. Uh, oftentimes, engineers and surveyors will use that reference frame. On the right is mean high, high water. Uh, that would be the zero in the OSC level rise viewer, for instance. Uh, but they're equated equal in this so using the right-hand side, the annual 1% chance on FEMA's flood maps, which have waves and have other phenomena, not just captured in the tide gauge estimates shown in the light blue, uh, more storm-driven. You can see about a nine foot above mean high, high water is about the 1% annual chance uh, with FEMA's definition. Um, and as you move to things that are, are more recurrent, they become more tidally driven. And that's where these tide gauge estimates sort of ring true. And we're actually working with FEMA now to kind of converge on the two so we can have better estimates of the more frequent types of flooding. And shown on the bottom there are the major, the moderate, and the high tide flood threshold at about two, three, and four feet. And you can, uh, on the x-axis, get an in, uh, instance of what's the return interval, the likelihood. Um, so the way that you kind of frame sea level rise, uh, assuming that storms don't change, or at least you're not impacted on a more frequent basis by major storms. Uh, you would uh, just adjust these curves up or down. In this case, with sea level rise, uh, the, the values would all go down. So for instance, right now, 
a four foot major flood would have somewhere about a, a 10 year return period or a one in 10 chance in any given year as the FEMA and the tide gauge estimates converge. Uh, with two feet of sea level rise, that four foot flood, you would assess that risk of a two foot flood and you would come over and follow that yellow line. And that's something that's happening several times a year. So you can sort of do the same sort of adjustments, at least as a first order screening estimate of how sea level rise is likely to impact uh, your, your community and what, you know, doing stress tests as to how you're developing uh, and, and how things may change under current flood defenses. Um, the last slide uh, just shows some current NOAA tools that we're developing. Uh, the upper left-hand corner uh, is NOAA Sea Level Rise Viewer and Flood Mapper. And here we have this high tide flood uh, elevations that are at or below these elevations that I was referring to that are accelerating. So you can get a sense of the land that's exposed currently to this type of flooding. Um, and you can go to the flood, uh, the Sea Level Rise Viewer and show what two, three, four, five, six, eight all the way up to 10 feet of additional sea level rise would look like at high tide to get a sense of, you know, if a storm came, you know, what might be impacted. Again, as you get to uh, with sea level rise, uh, as you get to the lesser extreme events, they become more tidally driven and less storm surge driven. More bathtub like, less storm uh, reflective of the storm characteristics themselves. On the bottom right hand, uh, is a, a image that the website that you can actually get next year's outlooks, a continuation of that quadratic fit, uh, giving you sort of some guidance as to what is likely to occur next year in case you need any kind of guidance as to budgeting for expected responses. We're starting to get more questions as to what can we expect next year, not only in the next several decades, but we give that to in 2030 and 2050. What's the expected uh, likely range on any given year uh, of, of these high tide floods. Uh, so this is at least a starting point to provide some actionable uh, guidance in terms of uh, impacts associated with these lesser extremes, not so much for the minor, uh, the, the very rare major consequences, which are much harder to predict uh, and uh, obviously more uncertain as we move into the future. Um, so with that, that uh, uh, concludes my testimony. I hope you find it useful and please visit these websites if you have more questions and or contact NOAA for any uh, more specific details as to uh, uh, as you need information to make your decisions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sweet. Uh, I just want to note that the slides referenced by Dr. Sweet during his testimony once they have been received and made accessible, will become part of the official testimony. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Brannon. Dr. Sweet, please stay unmuted if possible during the question and answer period. Thank you. Chair Brannon, please begin. Thanks, Jess. Uh, I want to acknowledge that we've been joined by my colleagues, uh, Councilman Costa, Costa Constantinidis, and of course, uh, Councilman Ruben Diaz Jr. and Councilwoman Debbie Rose is, is still with us as well. Um, Dr. Sweet, thank you so much for that. Um, can you explain sort of just, just as simply as you can, how does sea level rise affect the coastal flood risk? What's the relation there? How does that work? Sure. Um, you know, in general, you've got to, have, there's two parts to the problem. One is the typical uh, variability in your water levels from tides and storms. Um, we characterize this typically uh, at the tide gauge as to what's happened over the period of record. Uh, and we quantify that, okay, uh, through extreme water distribution. So what's the likelihood of water hitting X uh, height based on the historical record would have a certain probability. Uh, FEMA is similar, but they'll also factor in, um, you know, waves, and maybe storms that haven't really been observed, but could, they may generate a more of a, of a synthetic set of, of probabilities to say it hasn't happened yet, but it could under today's climate, what might that risk be? So, you know, roll the dice a hundred thousand times versus, you know, roll the dice a hundred times as observations may show. Nonetheless, you characterize then what's the likelihood based on uh, observations or plausible conditions under today's environment, um, so you have a set of probabilities. Then with sea level, as it rises, then you essentially are saying, 
uh, without any extra understanding of how flood, uh, you know, storms may change or tides may change, uh, with one, two, three feet of sea level rise, then under the variability of the rolling the dice, uh, it just will show that the probability of all events become more likely. Um, to what extent on an annual basis, five, 10 times a year, or does something go from a 100-year event to a 50-year event plays out underneath sort of that bell-shaped distribution curve I showed. So in short, with sea level rise, the risk of flooding of any severity increases um, to under today's flood defenses. So that, that's basically the short. And you can do the quantification and do the math. Uh, your engineers and designers will do that. But that's the fact of the matter is flood risk has already increased due to sea level rise and due to future sea level rise, it will continue to increase. So what, doctor, what should the city be doing to address for, to address and prepare for these increasing, increasing risks? Well, as the uh, risk becomes more likely, the lesser extremes start, uh, you know, become something that might be now a 20 year event, eventually it becomes an annual event. These, as they become annual and more frequent, it's more tidally driven. It's more bathtub like, pay attention to your elevation. Lower elevations are more at risk than higher elevations. Um, and that's basically the way that uh, the sea level rise is playing out. It's uh, the things that are becoming that were once frequent or more storm driven as they become more likely to become tidally driven. And the tide's sort of going to go where the tide wants to go. Um, you know, it's going to go subsurface. It's eventually going to pump up groundwaters. It's going to find its conduits in. So it really becomes an elevation game. So I guess the simple guidance that NOAA has been doing is saying, you know, we don't know exactly what trajectory is going to occur, but we do know that lower elevations will be more at risk when you have the opportunity to replace, uh, replace or move critical infrastructure. Definitely pay attention to elevations. Um, and, and that is probably the 101 in, in how to help protect, you know, important infrastructure is pay attention to elevations. Um, with sunny day flooding and, and nuisance flooding, um, what do we, what do we expect between, you know, na say the next 10 years, the next 30 years, how, how often will, will that occur? Do we predict? Well, under our definition of, which is about two feet above mean high tide, which is pretty much right in line with the weather services, uh, you know, last year had about 10, 10 days next year, somewhere upwards of. 10 to 15. By 2030, that's likely to rise to uh, 20 to 40 days. And by 2050, that number is likely to be somewhere between 50 and 135 days out of the year. Again, uh, it can bounce around. You have variability in any given year of sea levels as well as uh, you know the number of days for high tide flooding. But that's the range under that likely amount of sea level rise uh, that was shown, which is somewhere between two and four feet by 2100. But even just at 2050, the number of days is likely to increase somewhere between 50 and 135 days per year at affecting that elevation. What are, what are your, your recommendations for, for mitigating against sunny day flooding? Uh, again, it's very much uh, uh, elevation driven. You know, one thing's for certain where impacts are already a problem, they will continue to get worse. Other areas that currently are impacted are likely to become impacted. But again, since we're only sort of providing guidance at a fixed elevation, we're really just talking about frequency increases in these areas. But we know that it's just not this threshold. If, if a foot higher is going to be even less, uh, you know, it's more rare today, but they're going to become more probable. So we could do the same sort of math. But it, essentially, the stormwater drains are going to become continuously infiltrated. Uh, lower elevations are continuously going to flood and saturate. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a hard idea. I'm not exactly sure, you know, giving best guidance of how to respond. But again, uh, areas that are being impacted now, they're only going to experience more uh, impacts in the future. So if, you know, if the infrastructure is not meant to be inundated, if it's not expect, uh, uh, designed to be exposed to salt water, then that very well will be a problem and continue uh, to be a problem moving forward. And what do you um, what do you make of this 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 
very, very busy uh, hurricane season we're seeing. Yeah, it's something, you know, as we move forward, um, climate models all predict, you know, more uh, intense storms, maybe not necessarily more storms in general. Uh, you know, it's mixed science right now as to exactly how uh, frequency will play out. But one thing's for certain is that there are patterns. Uh, big storms do occur. Um, the likelihood of, of hitting one particular area, you know, is not the same as the likelihood of the, you know, storms increasing in general. Uh, but I think it's important to recognize that, you know, if there is a risk of major flooding from major storms, that that needs to be understood. Um, the sediments, deposits, there are a lot of ways of overwash of people analyzing, you know, past storm frequency. These big storms aren't necessarily... Uh, overly uh, rare you know i think the hurricane sandy's type of events have been documented probably occurred several times in the last uh, several hundred years in, in the area of of new york city um so there are ways of understanding what the risks are at least based on historical record um you know that is something that is is very difficult to fully uh characterize and develop probabilities of saying you know what's the likelihood of a eight nine ten foot flood uh, they're just very rare. But I think what is more uh, with more certainty are these lesser extremes, the things that happen, you know, once every 10 years or so, they're going to become much more probable. We have observed them and we know what to expect with, with sea level rise. So there's two ways to adapt. The big storms have big problems and you can expect them just, you know, very rarely and you can build walls and try to prevent the surge from occurring. But the lesser extremes being more tidally driven are going to find other ways, other conduits to access a community. So I think it poses sort of a binary challenge in, in how to live with threats that are, you know, rare and severe and those that are lesser uh, extreme, but becoming more frequent uh, at, under future sea level rise. Right. Thank you, doctor. I appreciate your time. I don't know if any of my colleagues have questions for, for the doctor. Okay. Great. Doctor, thank you so much. We really appreciate this. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Brannon, and thank you, Dr. Sweet. We will now call on members of the administration to testify. First, Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency, followed by Deputy Commissioner of Response, John Grimm of New York City Emergency Management. For the question and answer period only, we will also be joined by Assistant Commissioner of Response, Joanna Conroy from New York City Emergency Management. Before we begin, I will administer the oath. Director Bavishi, Deputy Commissioner Grimm, and Assistant Commissioner Conroy. I will call on each of you individually for a response. Please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before these committees and to respond honestly to council member questions? Director Bavishi. Yes, I do. Deputy Commissioner Grimm. I do. Assistant Commissioner Conroy. I do. Thank you. Director Bavishi, you may begin when ready. Good morning. I am Janie Bavishi, Director of the Mayor's Office of Resiliency. I would like to thank Chair Brannon and Council Members Diaz, Constantinidis, Ulrich, and Rose for the opportunity to testify today. I would also like to acknowledge my colleagues, Deputy Commissioner Grimm and Assistant Commissioner Conroy from New York City Emergency Management. Deputy Commissioner Grimm will be providing testimony and he and Assistant Commissioner Conroy will join me in answering your questions. As you know, Hurricane Sandy was the most catastrophic natural disaster in New York City's history. The storm, strong winds, and immense storm surge devastated entire communities, causing $19 billion in damage and tragically taking the lives of 44 New Yorkers. Since Hurricane Sandy, we've made considerable progress toward making New York City safer and more resilient. The importance and urgency of this work has only been further emphasized by how climate change is playing out in our country and around the world. 
This year has brought devastating and persistent wildfires in the Western states and so many Atlantic hurricanes that we've resorted to using the Greek alphabet to name them. These disasters make it clear that amidst the ongoing pandemic, we must also continue to prepare for future severe extreme weather events fueled by climate change. Since Hurricane Sandy, our office has partnered with different city, state, and federal agencies to complete several key coastal resiliency projects. In August of 2019, the city completed a wetlands restoration project in Broad Channel, Queens, one of the lowest lying areas in all of New York City. Several months later, in October of 2019, we completed another wetlands restoration project on the west shore of Staten Island. These projects took environmentally degraded sites and breathed new life into them. They also created new nature-based buffers that will reduce wave impacts during storms and provide rich wildlife habitats. These completed projects build on our many other accomplishments, including the reconstructed Rockaway Boardwalk, a tea growing project in Seagate, Brooklyn, beach renourishments in the Rockaways between Beach 92nd and 103rd Streets, street raisings in Broad Channel, Queens, 26 completed Blue Belts projects across three boroughs, and Emergency Management's Interim Flood Protection Measures Program, which now covers more than 50 sites across the city. As you all know, large capital coastal protection projects take years of planning, contracting, and development. And I'm excited to report we're officially breaking ground on the Rockaways Atlantic Shorefront Project later this week on the anniversary of Hurricane Sandy. This project will span six miles from Far Rockaway to Jacob Reese Beach. Earlier this month, the city also broke ground on a $75 million expansion of the Mid Island Blue Belt on Staten Island, which uses a series of streams, ponds, and wetlands to capture rainfall and prevent flooding. And that is not all. We also plan to break ground on the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project next month. This project is one of the most technically complex and ambitious climate adaptation projects anywhere in the world. It's also critically important for advancing climate justice in New York City, seeing as it will protect a highly diverse community that includes more than 28,000 NYCHA residents. This community was devastated by Hurricane Sandy, and this project will deliver the protection they need. We're also continuing to advance many other resiliency projects all across the city, from Red Hook to Jamaica Bay to Staten Island. Our office also continues to focus on ensuring that New York City is prepared using a multi-hazard strategy that addresses risks not only related to coastal storms, but also from intense precipitation, extreme heat, and sunny day flooding caused by chronic sea level rise. One notable example of our multi-hazard approach in action is the Get Cool NYC program created by Mayor de Blasio just as COVID-19 cases were starting to reach their peak in New York City. Recognizing that extreme heat is a silent killer, this program provided free air conditioners to 74,000 elderly low-income New Yorkers. With fewer cooling options available to New Yorkers due to the rapidly spreading virus, this program allowed vulnerable seniors to stay safe and cool in the comfort of their own homes. As we enter a new era of climate catastrophe, we expect that more initiatives like this one will be needed to counter the effects of simultaneous and overlapping disasters. As we advance large scale generational infra infrastructure projects on the coastline, we must remain nimble and adaptable to other emerging threats, including those that impact inland areas. Additionally, we're glad to announce that this year we published the fourth update to the city's climate resiliency design guidelines, a critical tool that can be used to increase resiliency for public facilities and infrastructure, supporting a stronger and safer New York City while also saving taxpayers money through avert averted losses. All of our work is and must continue to be informed by the best available science and localized data. This year, we proudly announced the fourth New York City panel on climate change, which is the most diverse, credentialed, and multidisciplinary panel yet. These 20 members will produce actionable and authoritative scientific information on climate change, research that is critical in grounding our office in a clear understanding of what types of climate risks we face, how they intersect, and what solutions are most appropriate for mitigating these hazards. Looking forward into the future, we are also focused on seizing the opportunities that come with confronting climate change. In particular, we are excited about a recently announced rezoning that will enable the creation of a climate adaptation center on Governor's Island. This center will create an international hub for climate research, engineering, and design that is focused on the solutions that communities and cities need to navigate climate-related threats. This effort, effort is projected to create 8,000 direct new jobs and $1 billion in economic impact for New York City. We hope to work closely with the Council and the Trust for Governors Island to maximize the impact of this bold and ambitious project. While the city has made great, has made great strides toward a multi-hazard and multi-layered approach to resiliency, there's still much work to be done, and much of it can only be accomplished through the collaboration and partnership with our federal and state partners. We hope to see increased investment from the federal government through a stimulus action in the future, 
long awaited reforms to the National Flood Insurance Program that improve affordability and flexibility for urban environments and a reinstated harbor and tributary study by the Army Corps of Engineers. Additionally, we are hopeful that the Mother Nature Bond Act will move forward in the next legislative, se le legislative session at the state level, providing critical funding for important green infrastructure projects, stormwater management, coastal protections, and heat mitigation strategies. In conclusion, I would like to thank the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts for allowing me to testify here today. I will now yield to Deputy Commissioner Grimm from New York City Emergency Management and look forward to your questions following my colleague's testimony. Thank you, Director Bavishi. Next, we'd like to invite Deputy Commissioner Grimm from New York City Emergency Management to testify. Deputy Commissioner Grimm, when you're ready. Thank you. Good morning, Chair Brennan and members of the New York City Council. I am John Grimm, Deputy Commissioner for Response at New York City Emergency Management. I'm joined by my colleague, Johanna Conroy, Assistant Commissioner for Interagency Operations. We are pleased to be here to discuss hurricane preparedness for the 2020 season, which has been extremely active and required us to consider cascading impacts from COVID-19. New York City faces the biggest threat to hurricanes and coastal storms from August through November. This hearing is a poignant reminder that devastating hurricanes, such as Hurricane Sandy, can still wreak havoc late in the season. In one of the most active hurricane seasons in memory, we have tracked 28 tropical cyclones in the Atlantic Basin, 27 of which were named storms and 11 that were categorized as hurricanes. Preparation for coastal storms requires coordination, coordinated planning to ensure the city is ready to react at any given time. We have a robust training and exercise program to build the capacity to carry out the response and annually host exercises involving city hall executives, agency commissioners, and interagency partners with the goal of rehearsing critical decision-making during a coastal storm. An important part of our mission is to support preparedness for all New Yorkers. The Know Your Zone campaign encourages New Yorkers to identify if they live in a hurricane evacuation zone, know the hazards they may face, and take the necessary steps to be prepared. In conjunction with our Ready New York and Ready Kids program, we have educated hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers and will work diligently to increase these numbers every day. We are aware that COVID-19 presents a different set of challenges for coastal storm preparedness. Many months ago, we tasked members of our cascading impacts planning team to adapt plans to meet this new challenge. Together with our partners at the federal and state level and within the private sector, we are finding solutions. For example, by encouraging New Yorkers to add sanitizer and masks to their go bags, by updating our stockpile for evacuation centers, and by working with DOE to ensure that public schools used as evacuation centers can have expanded footprint to ensure adequate social distancing by using classrooms and other spaces and floor markings for proper flow. Already COVID-19 and this hurricane season has provided us with opportunities to learn. Additionally, NISM leads the city's efforts to provide temporary deployable flood protection for critical facilities and neighborhoods in low-lying coastal areas through the Interim Flood Protection Program. For the first time outside of an exercise, emergency management activated one of 55 operational sites in response to forecasted coastal storm impacts within the South Street Seaport area, which showed the highest potential for coastal flooding from tropical storm Isaias. While ultimately impacts from Isaias did not materialize in this area, the deployment provided useful operational experience and we are applying the lessons learned for future deployments at site across all five boroughs. This is a great example of how we plan, implement, take information gained during an activation and use it to make our city more resilient in the future. NISEN will continue to develop adapt and innovate our hurricane preparedness measures to provide the best strategies and resources for the city of New York. Across the boroughs, we applaud the efforts of the city council in communicating with your constituents on how to prepare for emergencies. We ask as always that you continue to promote Notify NYC, the city's free service that provides timely, accurate information during emergencies, including coastal storms. Thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to answer any questions.
Thank you. I will now turn it over to questions from Chair Brannon. For these questions, we will additionally be joined by Assistant Commissioner of Response, Johanna Conroy from New York City Emergency Management. Panelists, please stay unmuted if possible during this question and answer period. As a reminder, if council members other than Chair Brannon would like to ask a question of the administration or a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer your questions. Thank you. Chair, Be Chair Brannon, please begin. Thank you, Council. Uh, I just want to acknowledge that we had been joined by Councilman uh, Eric Ulrich as well. Um, Director, during last year's oversight hearing on the seventh anniversary of Superstorm Sandy, which really feels like yesterday, it's kind of creepy, um, MOR testified that the best strategy for future resiliency planning uh, was to continue advocating for the Army Corps uh, to finish their New York, New Jersey Harbor and Tributary study. Um, and the federal government stopped funding that study uh, back in February 2020, unfortunately. Um, to, I guess two things. What will we use as a blueprint for uh, coastal resiliency projects now? Uh, and what actions are you taking to ensure uh, that coastal protections will be in place throughout the five boroughs and along the, the 520 miles of our shoreline? Uh, thank you for the question, Chair Brandon. So let me take that question in two parts. Um, first of all, I just want to um, just want to say that in terms of resiliency uh, uh, action for the city, um, we're not only preparing for the climate change impacts that will um, impact our coastline, but we are also preparing for the impacts of intense precipitation and um, extreme heat. Um, and so the, the work that we're doing, and, and there's an enormous amount of work in all five boroughs to prepare for all of the climate change impacts we face, um, ranges from uh, infrastructure hardening to planting trees to building thousands of rain gardens. Um, it's a massive undertaking and, and we're uh, much further ahead than any other city in the United States. Um, so just wanted to make sure that we're, in terms of resiliency planning, we're talking about that um, entire suite of actions um, that uh, we're, we're advancing and, and the entire suite of hazards that we face. Um, in terms of the harbor and tributary study, um, you know, we were really disappointed in the Trump's administration decision to defund the study. It was a reckless decision and it will literally cost lives. Um, and we have opposed that decision from the moment that the president tweeted about it. Um, we are very hopeful that after the election in November, the study will be reinstated. Um, that could either be accomplished by a new administration or it could be accomplished by Congress. Um, but, you know, in the meantime, we have known for years that we can't wait for Washington. And that's why we've been moving ahead with our own resiliency projects and our own plan. Um, our, our plan is documented in the Special Initiative on Resiliency and Rebuilding Report that was issued in 2013 and has been um, updated and, um, and progress has been reported on since then um, through the 1NYC reports, um, including the update last year in 2019. Um, and, and we are um, focused heavily on the coast, um, but we're, like I said, also looking to address threats um, uh, beyond the coast as well. Um, so uh, we, we are uh, advancing massive infrastructure projects on the coast, coastal protection projects, including ones that um, I addressed in my testimony, um, uh, coastal protection projects like wetlands restoration projects in Broad Channel and Staten Island, but also um, very complex infrastructure projects like the Rockaway Reformulation uh, Project, which we'll uh, be announcing groundbreaking on later this week, um, and Eastside Coastal Resiliency, which we'll be breaking ground on next month. Um, and then also uh, uh, projects to uh, address extreme heat in central Brooklyn and in the South Bronx um, and work to address extreme rain. Um, things like uh, building thousands of, of curbside rain gardens all over the city, which capture rainfall and prevent flooding. Have, um, have you identified um, community priorities for adaptation alongside um, the Plan, planned or constructed uh, federal city or state uh, projects? 
community priorities for adaptation. Um, yes, we we uh, work with communities across the city um, uh, when we're planning and um, uh, designing our adaptation projects, and we also consult. Um, community adaptation plans or community resilience plans that are developed by uh, community-based groups and, and nonprofit partners. Um, community engagement has been absolutely critical to all of our work. Um, uh, we, you know, it, 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 we, we take it incredibly seriously and we've been um, prioritizing it as we design um, and, and implement our projects. So, um, we face multiple challenges here as a city due to climate change that, that intersect with other challenges that are faced by um, low-income communities and communities of color. Um, affordable housing, urban heat, sea level rise, just, just to name a few. Um, how has the administration analyzed the cross-section of these issues to, to really understand the risks and, and, and what are we doing uh, to take this into account as planning continues? We are um, working very closely with our agency partners. Um, for example, you know, HPD um, recently released the Where We Live report, um, which is a report that focuses on um, advancing fair housing. Um, it also accounts for climate change. Um, and this is exactly the kind of action we need to continue to see. We need to continue to um, embed climate change considerations into everything the city does. Um, and the only way we're gonna do that is by continuing to build capacity um, within agencies so that as they are executing their missions and their operations, they're also accounting for climate change impacts. Um, only then will we start seeing that, that cross-section, um, that, that's the, the really seeing and acting on the nexus of the different kinds of issues that um, that you are asking about. And um, we're already seeing that kind of action take place. Is there, are we doing anything sort of comprehensive and holistic as it relates to, to this, as, as opposed to just sort of spots here and there? Um, we are, uh, I mean, I, I think that, that it, it, it's reflected in the, um, in various city planning processes, right? So, um, uh, we're, we're, the comprehensive approach we're taking is to build climate change considerations into, um, into city levers and city policies, right? City planning processes. We're building climate change into our building code. We're, we're accounting for climate change in our zoning code. And in fact, uh, the Department of City Planning just released, just made an announcement about progress on um, zoning for coastal resiliency, which will um, acknowledge that strong building codes are really critical to resiliency. And we need to make sure we ma are making it easier for single, single family homeowners in particular to, um, to uh, account for flood resiliency um, and, and, and protect their homes. So we're, we're basically working to create a culture of resiliency within the city government. Um, that's about as comprehensive as it gets. It, it's gonna take some time and we're, we're, um, uh, but, and, and we're gonna continue to work on it, but, um, but that is our goal. Do you think the city is giving enough the same amount of attention to the, the so-called out of boroughs as it does to lower Manhattan? Absolutely. A uh, uh, um, holistic approach starts with the highest risk areas. Um, and that's what we've been doing. We've been focused on high risk areas all across the city. Um, like I said, we're, um, we're uh, advancing the Rockway Reformulation Project in Queens. Um, we are advancing uh, the Staten Island Coastal Storm Risk Management Project in Staten Island. We're advancing um, a integrated flood protection system in Red Hook, Brooklyn. Um, these are just the major coastal protection projects, but there are um, also uh, projects underway to address extreme heat and intense precipitation all across the city. So I saw a recent article in the Times that was talking about how some coastal communities are looking at managed retreat um, and neighborhood-based buyout programs to help steer development away from the shoreline, uh, particularly in, in um, flood flood plone uh, neighborhoods. Um, I know FEMA and HUD have announced programs to pay for large-scale uh, relocation. So as the city studied um, the need for expanding the availability of, of neighborhood-based buyout programs? 
the city implemented a number of buyout programs right after Sandy, um, and this was done with um, federal funding. It was there were also some programs that were run by the state um, and by the federal by federal agencies themselves directly. Um, we are uh, uh, certainly looking at those programs um, and uh, looking at the lessons learned from those programs. Um, we've also, in parallel, uh, instituted special coastal risk districts, which is a new, uh, a fairly new zoning designation that um, limits density in the most vulnerable areas um, of the city, um, which is an important important step. Um, we are. Uh, Currently, the city does not have a financing um, a stream of a way to finance uh, buyouts um, outside of that those post Sandy federal funding streams that we had. So, so earlier this month, um, and this sort of ties into funding for for all these resiliency projects, which which we're all concerned about. Um, I know earlier this month, Moody's downgraded the city's credit ratings. Um, you know, and, and obviously the downgrade reflects, um, you know, the substantial financial challenges that we're facing right now. Um, and, you know, Moody's is saying the city is on a longer recovery path than most other cities. Um, how will this downgrade, which impacts uh, almost $40 billion of the city's general obligation bonds, how will that impact the funding for resiliency projects this year? or in the next five to 10 years? What's, what's the immediate plan there and, and how are we triaging or, or prioritizing what we do have and what's expected? Uh, funding for resiliency projects, um, most of our resiliency projects, I should say, um, are uh, funded by at least some federal or state funding. That funding is locked in. Um, the city has also invested a considerable amount of funding into uh, many resiliency projects across the city. Um, in terms of how the Moody's, Moody's credit rating or bond rating um, affects uh, uh, New York City's uh, funding for resiliency projects, um, that's probably a question for OMB. I'm not a financial manager. I'm just a, for the city. I'm just a, a, a resilience policy expert, so I can't really address that specifically. I'm but I'm sorry. Go ahead. But I will say that we're continuing to be aggressive about um, uh, pursuing federal and state funding streams, especially proactive funding streams, because the, like I said, those uh, funding streams are absolutely an important catalyst um, for some of these uh, more expensive, um, large complex coastal infrastructure projects. Right, I guess the reason why I'm asking is because I know this. I know there's a, a city match component to a lot of these projects, so I don't know if there's been internal discussions as, you know, I mean, are all these, so are you saying that all these projects are, all systems go, that nothing's on pause, nothing's in, in jeopardy of being halted or anything? There have been no funding cuts to resiliency projects, um, even uh, in, in the context that we're operating in. And we're facing, like you said, um, you know, an unprecedented financial crisis, the, the worst since the Great Depression, we're um, navigating the, um, the needs of the, the pandemic um, while also working to address uh, the racial injustices um, uh, that we see in our society and um, uh, be proactive about the climate crisis. So we're navigating all these layers of crisis at the same time. There have been no funding cuts to resiliency projects and we're moving ahead. Okay. So even, even with the federal government threatening to withhold funding from the city, we're not worried about that. What I can say is that the funding that we are currently counting on um, to uh, uh, support the resiliency projects that are underway, that funding is locked in. Okay. Um, for what about for future projects? Are we, you know, for planning for um, resiliency projects? Is the city assuming that there will be adequate state and funding uh, and federal funding levels, or? If, you know, are there different models for that? Or, or is there a contingency? Are we planning for it? I don't wanna just, you know. I think there are a lot of exciting opportunities on the horizon. The one that I will specifically uh, highlight and I mentioned in my testimony is the Mother Nature Bond Act that um, made some progress in the state legislature um, this past year. Um, you know, uh, due to the pandemic, it, it, um, it didn't end up moving forward, but, um, you know, I think there was broad support for it and, and we'd love to see that 
um, advanced again next year and it would be an important source of funding, especially for green infrastructure projects, stormwater management projects, um, coastal resiliency and heat mitigation. Um, and, you know, I consistently say and we'll say here again that we need more support from the federal government, especially uh, proactive funding for resiliency projects. Too often the funding from, federal, for, from the federal government only flows after a disaster and we don't wanna be reactive, we wanna be proactive. And so um, I uh, you know, would love to see um, more pre-disaster mitigation funding um, and uh, would appreciate you know, any um, partnership from council on advocating for that. Sure, I mean, it would certainly be helpful to have someone in the White House who acknowledged climate, the climate crisis as the existential threat that it is. Um, I know that there was, I read somewhere that there was a $3 billion bond that was pulled this year. Um, was that the Mother Nature bond debt? I don't, I don't know, I'd have to look it up, but I know that there was a bond that had been pulled from the ballot I don't know. Yeah, I think that's the Mother Nature Bond Act. So it, it was um, a, a, a bond act that was um, that passed the state legislature and um, would have been up for as a ballot measure. Um, the governor decided not to move forward with it, given everything else that is going on. Uh, but again, like I said before, we um, you know are excited about the, the possibility of it um, and it, it received broad support and we hope to see it move forward in the next legislative session. Okay. Can you provide um, a list of the projects with uh, projected cost of each project and, and then which agency is funding it so we can get an idea of where we're at with everything? Uh, can I follow up with you on that? <laughs> yeah, um, it's important. But you know, I, I, I'd like to know how we're prioritizing funding for the different projects. If, if some are being funded and some aren't, obviously that's super important. Yeah, I believe we sent information to your office about that, but I'm happy to follow up and find out what uh, what else is needed. Okay, um, the this somewhat related the Sandy funding tracker um, that was created after the storm. Um, for those that don't know, it was provided to provide the public with information about pro projects and spending data uh, related to the, the recovery efforts. Does the tracker include? only projects that are funded by the city? The tracker includes uh, projects that are funded by federal sources. Okay, so it's, so then it's everything. Um, yeah, so this, the Sandy funding tracker, um, so let me just take a step back and say that, um, that the, the, the city's resilience funding is, is actually quite complex. Um, we have funding um, uh, that is invested by the city, by, by federal sources. Um, some projects are um, reflected in the city's budget. Others come directly from federal sources and don't come through the city. Um, so it is um, quite a, a, a complex um, you know, landscape of funding. Um, we are working to be as transparent as possible and the Sandy funding tracker um, accounts for all projects that have federal funding. But you know, if the council has um, other ideas about how to be more transparent about this funding, we're certainly open to the discussion. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I, for the, the Coastal Resiliency Project update, I, I just looked, I, I, we did get some of it from you guys, but not everything. So if you could provide us with the full, most recent up to date, I know it changes by the minute, but um, the info that you sent us was incomplete. So if you could send us to us, that'd be great, just to know where we're at with everything. Uh, absolutely, and I will um, just reiterate um, that there have been no funding cuts to resiliency projects. Okay. I believe you, I'm just scared. <laughs> um, so, um, another oh, another thing about the the the, uh, the Sandy Tracker, the, the most of the or many of the projects on there are uh, reconstruction projects. So if I wanted to see, or, or the general public wanted to see where the coastal resiliency projects are located, or their status, and and how much has been funded, where would I where would I find that? Is that available? Um, th that information is also on the Sandy Funding Tracker. Um, the Sandy Funding Tracker um, accounts for all projects that um, uh, were funded by post-Sandy dollars that flow to the city. 
um, and that includes um, that includes uh, coastal resiliency projects. Um, again, these are projects that um, that uh, are, are included in the city's budget. Um, there are also projects that um, don't don't come that, that where the funding doesn't come through the city. For example, the Army Corps projects. Um, so uh, those would not be included in the in the Sandy funding tracker. And again, if there are ways to improve transparency, we're certainly happy to talk about it. I know that council has had feedback about how to improve the Sandy funding tracker previously, and we yeah. incorporated that feedback. So um, we appreciate council's partnership on this. Yeah, I think, I mean, I don't think it's it's so much as the the um, transparency as it is that it's not all that user friendly. Um, you know, it, it might be publicly accessible, but I don't think it's as user friendly as it could be. I mean, I think I try to always make stuff so you can use it with your elbows, so to speak. Um, so I think that there could be work there. I don't know if that's something that MOR could lead on, but I think that would be helpful. Um, especially, you know, if we've got nothing to hide, then let's just show it, you know, and let's make it easy for folks to find it. Um, I'd love to work with you on that. I, we've gotten concerns from folks who, you know, are in the weeds on this stuff, you know, um, who also think that it's, it's not quite user friendly. So, um, I guess let's talk. I don't know if any of my colleagues are. I think I have anybody. Our Councilman Diaz is here. Okay. Um, let's talk a little bit about the 2020 hurricane season. Um, we've got a little bit more than a month to go. Um, we've had now 27 named storms, with 10 of them becoming hurricanes. Um, Isaias, I feel you know, caught us off guard. Um, and um, I guess, I guess my concern is that it, things are only gonna get worse, right? And this this hurricane season that everyone is saying, oh, we've never seen anything like this before. They're gonna start saying that every single year. Um, and this hurricane season is not gonna be an anomaly. <clears throat> um, so what is the city doing sort of broadly or, um, as we continue to see more frequent and, and, and stronger hurricanes, what are we doing to prepare um, for the increasing intensity and, um, uh, and likelihood of these storms? I'm going to defer to my colleague, Deputy Commissioner Grimm, to answer that question. Great. And I think he needs to be unmuted in order to be able to respond. All right. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for that question. And just to repeat the question again, you were asking for what we're looking to do forward to prepare ourselves for, for future storms. Right. I mean, you know, we all know hurricane season comes the same time every year, but now everywhere you look, they're telling us that it's worse than ever. It's on, it's unprecedented. We've had 27, we've gone through the whole alphabet already. Um, what, if anything, are we doing differently now that it seems that, that storms are, are clearly getting more frequent and, and more intense? Well, we're always in a cycle of continuing to work with our partners, you know, our partners at the federal state level, but also our city partners and our partners in the private, uh, private sector also. And that's something that, um, you know, our preparedness cycle is, is, is continuous. Um, you know, we are not in a spot where we would just uh, try to reach out and uh, work through plans uh, quickly, but that we are always in those conversations, always meeting with our partners and trying to increase our, our readiness. Um, and we do that, that increased readiness through our planning efforts, but also through our training and exercise programs, uh, where we have several uh, exercises throughout the year to ensure that we are communicating well, making decisions well together, uh, and also our outreach. Um, outreach is a huge piece of this um, because it's uh, not just, again, with our partners that we need to be prepared, but we wanna make sure that the public themselves take measures themselves to be educated and be prepared themselves. So we really try to do all those efforts um, on a continuous basis, uh, just to make sure we as an agency, a city, uh, is prepared as well as possible, but also, um, you know, all the members, all the public 
that they uh, themselves, again, are as ready as they can be uh, and they're prepared for, for different events that, that may come. So in being, I mean, I agree, obviously uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure and ultimately makes your life easier if there's less to react, you know, if we were being more proactive than reactive. Um, unfortunately, uh, it seems just overall in government, we're great at being reactive. We're not great at so great, not as great as being proactive. Um, are there different things that we're looking at? Or, I mean, you know, if, if the storms are actually getting worse, and more intense, is it just doing more of what we were already doing or are there different things we're, we're looking at or different things we should be doing? I, mean, I wanna be a partner to, to help. I mean, you look, I gotta say, emergency management, you guys were tremendous um, after Isaias. I, I can't say enough good things, um, but you know, immediately I start thinking about, well, if only we had done more uh, with tree maintenance, if only you know, the city paid more attention to the 311 calls about tree maintenance, that kind of thing that there would have been less to clean up after. Um, so has there been a significant change now that, you know, the, the, all the experts keep telling us that, that 2020, the hurricane season is just unheralded? Well, obviously, um, you know, we've, we've talked before after about uh, Tropical Storm Isaias, and we definitely look at our lessons learned or after actions what did we take from one storm that we can fix and improve? And, and we have continuing conversations you know, with the Parks Department, with Con Edison, uh, about how we can specifically do better and improve. And that's, that's something we always want to do. We always want to take our lessons learned, look at our after actions, and make improvements. Uh, we also are uh, looking at what uh, the National Hurricane Center is, is working on and preparing. And they've recently um, updated some of their uh, the, the surge modeling and what that would, uh, could potential, what an event could potential, potentially impact here in New York City. So we're looking at one of those, what they have created and how we need to adjust towards that. Um, so that's something uh, we'll be spending really this winter looking at, does that affect our, our, our evacuation zones? Does that affect centers that we've identified as evacuation centers? This is a lot of you know serious work that we need to be able to do, and we have to take that data and that information from the National Hurricane Center and make sure that we are applying it to to our plans and to our procedures. Uh, and that's really going to take a, a tremendous effort, looking through all that data and then overlaying it with with what we already have and what we've already planned for. Uh, so that that's going to be a, a very large uh, effort uh, throughout this winter. Um, and uh, Deputy, yeah, and, yeah were, thank you. No, Deputy, were you there during uh, Sandy? I don't remember. Yes, I was. Yeah, I was in a different. I was in a different position right. at the time, but I, I worked in the EOC in the Emergency Operations Center during Sandy. So, what did you? I mean, I guess what are the differences that you saw between Isaias and Sandy? I mean, I know there it's apples and oranges, but Isaias certainly was like two hours of destruction um, that we weren't really, you know, we thought it was gonna be a water event and it was really a wind event. Um, what, what were the main differences that you saw? Well, well, Sandy, right, Sandy hit everything, right? It was, it was, it, it was, it was flooding, right? It hit, um, you know, the, the trees went down, it was a wind event, it was a flooding event. It, it, there was a lot of cascading uh, uh, issues that, that we had to have with Sandy, so Sandy was was you know very very serious and had a lot of different impacts. Uh, where ECAS was really mainly a, a wind event. Uh, we were preparing for it to be potentially uh, some inundation uh, that ultimately didn't happen, thank goodness. Um, but it was, and when you look at the numbers, really it was only second only to Hurricane Sandy. And you know that wind event caused, uh, as we know, a tremendous amount of trees to go down, which then. Uh, caused a lot of power outages in the areas that have, um, you know, overhead power. And beyond that, it blocks streets, which is very, very concerning to us because if you have a blocked street, now an ambulance, uh, you know, uh, can't get down that street. So even in the areas that don't have overhead power lines, there are hazards that we are, you know, very much concerned with. And, and again, we are working very closely. We've worked closely with parks in the past. But again, we are working closely now with them 
to continue that conversation. What is it that we did during ESAIS that we can do better and what strategies do we need to implement? One of the things that we did during ESAIS is we went from a, a central coordination strategy to a decentralized uh, strategy, which I think really helped us out so that instead of trying to bring everything to one point, work to break, work at the borough level and resolve the problem uh, at a lower level at a quicker and more efficient uh, pace. Uh, we also uh, uh, created what we termed as tiger teams where Con Edison and parks or forestry crews would be joined together and would be working in concert with each other. And that made for a much more efficient uh, uh, and effective uh, uh, methodology to, uh, to uh, fix some of the issues where one crew, where a Con Edison crew wouldn't have to wait for a parks crew to come or vice versa, a parks crew wouldn't have downtime or a forestry crew wouldn't have downtime waiting on a Con Edison crew that we would link them and have them work in concert and just be a much more effective team. Could you, I mean, some people are fans of, of the Fantastic Four or the X-Men. I'm personally in favor of the Down Tree Task Force. Those are my favorite uh, superheroes. Um, can you walk us through, well, two things. Down Tree Task Force, which I think is great. Was that something that did not exist during Hurricane Sandy that we learned from and we created since then? The Downtree Task Force actually existed prior to Hurricane Sandy. I think okay. that was, um, it was when we had the tornadoes come through. Uh, I think it came through Barrage, Sunset yeah. Park. And, and so that was really uh, the time that, after that, the Downtree Task Force okay. was created. So it was created during Sandy, but during Sandy, uh, I think with the number of different events that happened and the number the damage all over the city, uh, it, it maintained the centralized system. And really since Sandy, every time it's been activated and it's kept with the centralized system, but with the, the numbers that we saw during ESAIS, uh, working with parks, uh, we thought decentralizing it made for a quicker turnaround on, on being able to make decisions and react to problems. So what, walk us through as far as, as far as um, um, emergency management is concerned. Um, the process of, of when a power line gets knocked down, um, what agencies work together? How, what's, what's the order of things that needs, like one of the things we ran into during Isaias was any tree that went down, um, you know, whether or not to the, you know, to the naked eye, it was, it was entangled in power lines. Usually no one could touch it until Con Ed sort of signed off on it, especially, you know, in the so-called outer boroughs where we still have overhead power lines, right? Um, is, what is the standard protocol if a power line comes down or a tree comes down? Con Ed first, number one, has to okay it before anyone can touch it. Is that how it goes? Well, first, we, we absolutely want people to call 911, right? If there's a down power line, call 911, because we, what we want is to make sure that, that that area is safe. And then if we need to shut down the block or cordon the area off, if there's a, a live wire down that people could you know, be killed from, could be injured, we really want to make sure first we keep people safe. Um, then also, you know, we do uh, collect the information in 311 about downed trees. But at this point, with it being a 911 call, we still do want it to, you know, uh, individuals from the public to make uh, the call into 311 so it can enter in that system. Um, but with a downed wire, absolutely, Con Ed needs to, uh, needs to make it safe before crews, forestry crews can come in there and, and address it. Um, so that's really the order of events. And I know with, with uh, Isaias, you know, they were, there was a, a lot of coordination uh, taking place to make sure that we were getting to those you know, critical, um, uh, critical down trees. And really the order of priority is uh, trees that are semi knocked down, right? Where a tree is not all the way down to the ground, but can, could continue to fall. That is something we're very concerned with because if it could continue to fall, it could fall on somebody um, or fall on something and do more damage or you know, potentially hurt or kill somebody. 
So those are the ones we really want to be able to get to. Then we're looking at um, uh, you know the block streets, which again we need to be able to open up the streets so that you know ambulances, fire, PD can make it if there's a some other emergency call. And then the, the trees that are entangled uh, with with the wires. Uh, often we see the those priorities really become a lot of times are, are they hit multiple priorities. You know, a tree that's hanging is hanging in the wires. That's what's keeping it, you know, from completely falling to the ground. Uh, so we want to be able to work very closely with Con Edison, get those crews out there, make it safe, not just for the public, but then for the follow-on forestry crews to be able to uh, address it. Um, that's helpful. Thank you. I have, to, I have to remember that next time I'm freaking out. Um, so CDC and FEMA um, and Red Cross as well, they all issued guidance for evacuation, if evacuation shelters are needed while we're dealing with COVID. Um, and the guidance emphasizes using, you know, smaller shelters rather than large uh, congregate areas, obviously because of COVID. Um, is, is if or if not, when, Will the guidance on this be available publicly? Is it available right now as far as what, what emergency management um, protocols are for this sort of thing? Uh, I don't know um, what's available publicly, but I, I can just answer real quick what we have done. Right. Um, working very closely with uh, Department of Education, uh, really we have kept the evacuation centers and the uh, shelters, the, the same locations. Uh, but what we've done, and again, working very closely with DOE, who, who has been a great partner to this, is expanded the areas in which people would be able to go, right? In the past, we would have wanted to limit that areas um, and try to utilize the larger spaces, the cafeterias, the gymnasiums. Uh, but now working with DOE, uh, expanding into the classrooms. And, uh, and, and that's very important to do, as you just uh, said, to be able to have that social distancing. So if someone had to evacuate, if, if a, a general evacuation was called, um, people would be able to arrive at an evacuation center. First, they would get screened um, because we wouldn't want someone with, you know, with COVID-19 to be, go into the general area. So they would get screened if someone has a temperature or uh, when we ask a series of questions, if we identify that, yes, okay, this person may have COVID, they will be isolated at that point, and then they could be transported uh, to a, a different facility uh, that would be appropriate for them. So the first step would be to do the screening. Then after that, within uh, the building, uh, there's floor markings, there's a flow of traffic so that you would not have people crisscrossing each other, but there would be one-way traffic to limit uh, interactions, and then to expand the spaces that we use in the buildings themselves so that people really would be able to social distance and would not have to congregate. And what is, um, I guess, the last, last thing, what is the trigger for when we decide to do a, a, an evacuation, a coastal evacuation? Well, that's really going to be uh, based on the forecast that we're receiving from the National Hurricane Center. So we are, we are in constant uh, uh, communication with the Nat National Weather Service, um, and then uh, you know, and then uh, we would work closer with the National Hurricane Center. Um, you know, as you know, we we are uh, in communication with the National Weather Service uh, usually multiple times a day, uh, just on just on day to day weather. But certainly in the lead up to a storm, we would be uh, working with them uh, very very closely and we're looking at their surge data and their search models, uh, and that would really be what would be driving the decision to if an evacuation is necessary and if one is necessary, what areas would be necessary. We really want the science to drive that, uh, drive that decision. Okay. Uh, Deputy, thank you very much. Thank uh, you, sir. Thank you. Council, I don't know if there's any of my colleagues that want to ask some questions. I think it's just uh, Reverend Diaz on. Okay, yep. thank you, Chair Brannon. Um, 
we will now turn to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling individuals one by one to testify. Each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer. Council members who have questions for a, for a particular panelist should use the raise hand function in Zoom. And I will call on you after the panelist has completed their testimony. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. First, we will be hearing from Kate Boycourt of the Waterfront, Al Waterfront Alliance followed by Carlos castell Croak from New York League of Conservation Voters. I would like to welcome Kate Boycourt to testify. Starting time. Thank you very much to the council member and uh, really appreciate your time and focus on this issue. Just briefly, Waterfront Alliance is a nonprofit civic organization and coalition of more than 1,100 community and recreational groups, educational institutions, businesses, and other stakeholders. Our mission is to inspire and enable resilient and revitalized and accessible coastlines for all communities. So this uh, hearing is very much in our wheelhouse. I think we've heard a lot today and given to the timeline of the challenge, I will keep it short to really where we are focusing, focusing on in terms of action, what we would like to see from the council and the city moving forward. Um, as we know, just last week, the city identified a report, uh, they released a report identifying more than 100,000 residential units projected to be in the floodplain by the 2050s. Um, so we need a strategy for that. Progress has been made and uh, we appreciate the direction of the resilient zoning recently released. And there is an upcoming comprehensive waterfront plan that we're looking forward to seeing from the city uh, and, and seeing how that addresses these, these challenging issues. Uh, at the same time, we are, we're calling on the council to, to partner with us uh, and others. We have a coalition of more than 90 organizations of which uh, a couple are reflected here uh, that are fighting for federal, state and local policy change so that we can take a more comprehensive approach. So we are just calling on a few, I'll, I'll name five things that we're aiming for today. Uh, one, we, we'd like to see a framework that informs all land use and infrastructure planning, capital development and uh, building regulations that measurably reduces the risks that we have to a suite of adaptation options suitable to, to those risks in those every single neighborhood. Uh, three uh, programs to support a climate transition from increasing the funding for the Center for New York City Neighborhoods Flood Help New York program, establishment of a voluntary buyout program, and supporting and continuing to maintain the resources for emergency preparation and response programs. We also, like we heard earlier today, are really counting on our city to mobilize federal dollars from hopefully stimulus funds, FEMA's Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, future infrastructure bills, crossing our hands for the Water Resources Development Act, and others that will allow us to really mobilize and, and create green jobs that are addressing this solution. And I heard something about financing strategies I think we need to start thinking um, not only federal and, and state level, but on different financing strategies at all levels of government. Lastly, uh, partnering and planning regionally with the US Army Corps of Engineers and communities to build a better plan for the region. Uh, and that's my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. That was great. Thank you so much. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Next to testify will be Carlos Castell Pro of the New York League of Conservation Voters, followed by Jessica Roth of Riverkeeper. Carlos Castell Croak, you may begin when the Sergeant announces. Starting time. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Castell Croak. Mm -hmm. I am the Associate for New York City Programs at the New York League of Conservation Voters. 
NYLCV represents over 30,000 members in New York City, and we are committed to advancing a sustainability agenda that will make our people, our neighborhoods, and our economy healthier and more resilient. I'd like to thank Chair Brandon for holding this important hearing and the, for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, when Superstorm Sandy hit our city in 2012, it was dubbed a one in a hundred year storm, a misleading label that undervalues the growing threat climate change continues to impose on our world. We believe that in order to better protect our city from this threat, we must establish a resiliency plan that preemptively protects us from another superstorm like Sandy. To date, much of our resiliency work has been reactive and from fragmented relying on federal disaster response funds mobilized by devastation to help certain vulnerable neighborhoods recover and build back stronger. But in a city of islands with 520 miles of coastline, this approach is inadequate. We need comprehensive and anticipative citywide approach to resiliency. NYLCV supports the passage of legislation such as intro 1620 that would establish and implement a resiliency plan to protect us before another superstorm hits. This plan should build off of and work in tandem with existing community-based plans, such as the Special Initiative for Building and Resiliency and the local waterfront revitalization plans to reduce redundancies in our resilience work. The plan should also accurately evaluate and report on the specific risks to waterfront properties, neighborhoods, and developments, and be updated regularly to reflect current storm and flood data so that we may develop clear, assess accessible, and equitable targets for risk reduction. This is critical for low-income communities and communities of color who often bear the brunt of the effects of climate change. Lastly, since our waterfront is home to so many critical infrastructure, so much critical infrastructure, from public housing to airports, to power facilities, to wastewater treatment plants, it is also important that the plan brings those relevant stakeholders into the planning process. A full list of comprehensive priorities for this plan will be found in my written testimony. As climate change continues to intensify the magnitude and frequency of natural disasters, it has become clear that New York does not have the luxury, luxury of choosing whether or not to improve its resiliency. It is a requirement. Taking a proactive approach will get, us, get out in front of the problem before more lives and infrastructure are threatened. We will continue to work with the council and our partners in the Rise to Resilience Coalition for a more resilient future for our city. I'd like to also add that NYLCV is also um, very supportive of uh, State Environmental Bond Act, and we hope to see that uh, back on the ballot next year. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much. We will next be hearing from Jessica Roth of Riverkeeper, followed by Summer Sandoval of Uproads. Jessica Roth, you may begin when the sergeant calls you. Starting time. Good afternoon, Chair Brannon, Council Members. Thanks for holding this important hearing on the anniversary of Superstorm Sandy. Um, my name is Jessica Roth. I'm the Director of Advocacy and Engagement for Riverkeeper, which is a membership organization with nearly 55,000 members and constituents. We protect and restore the Hudson River from source to sea and safeguard drinking water supplies through advocacy rooted in community partnerships, science, and law. We're extremely concerned that the federal government did not find a resiliency plan for this region important enough to fund in the next fiscal year. And that really highlights the importance of the city's role to make sure that something is done properly, even recognizing that the course feasibility study was deeply flawed and lacking in full incorporation of sea level rise and ecosystem services threats and community engagement. We need to, um, we need to move forward with a, a comprehensive regional plan. Uh, the study re relied heavily on in-water barriers, which properly, which didn't actually account for flood risk and threats to ecological processes and water quality. And uh, Dr. Philip Orton and his colleagues' most recent study on storm surge barrier protection showed that. I'll be including that with my um, testimony. Um, and it's showing that sea level rise will, con will continue to cause exponential increase in frequency for closure of gates and the duration of time that they would have to be closed. And so clearly we are, and he, he concludes in his study that, um, that the kinds of decisions about where to be building and how to be building onshore measures should be done on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, and that we should be talking about managed retreat and non-structural options as better options. Um, and we strongly support those alternatives, and as well as being a member of the steering committee of Waterfront Alliance's convened Rise to Resilience Coalition support their recommendations as well. We recommend following the guidelines of the models from Climate Ready Boston, which is a multi-level, multi-approach, multi, multi, multi um, 
level approach to dealing with uh, within an architecture of accommodation, including things like living shorelines, green infrastructure, um, and other measures that will help support our waters and our ecosystems and allow our sewage system to continue to function without threatening to pollute New York City communities with trap water. Um, it's also important that when we're looking at a plan such as uh, a, a five borough resilience plan that we require greater community engagement and foster important community buy-in such as the took place with the climate ready plan. Um, the, because of the fact that, um, that this is so critical and has been lacking for so long, it's also really important that whatever steps we take moving forward include securing systems of funding and actual incorporation of the participation of communities in especially frontline communities, shoreline communities and black indigenous and communities of color and to make sure that those voices are prioritized in anything moving forward. We need to learn from the lessons uh, from the HAT study and the failures in it and in order to fully integrate uh, sea level rise and mitigate against the ecosystem services and environmental threats. Uh, it's also critical that we look to communities for their expertise uh, on protective measures and what's already happening, excuse me, what's already happening with I'm expired. So we thank you for this opportunity and I'll be submitting more uh, detailed comments, including um, Orton's study, as well as our testimony from last year, because there's a lot of the similar issues that we addressed in our testimony on 1620 last year. So thanks very much for the time. Thanks, Jess. Thank you. We will now hear testimony from Summer Hall of Uprose followed by Daniel Gutman of the Metropolitan Storm Surge Working Group. Summer Sandoval, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Starting time. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to submit testimony today on the eighth anniversary of Super Storm Sandy. My name is Summer Sandoval and I'm the Energy Democracy Coordinator at Uprose. I'm here today on behalf of Uprose to share the importance of supporting community-led comprehensive waterfront planning in the era of COVID-19 and climate change. Founded in 1966 and located in Sunset Park, Brooklyn, Uprose is an intergenerational BIPOC community-based organization working at the intersection of racial justice and climate change. Today, we are faced with multiple crises, all hitting communities of color and low-income communities the hardest. As we, as we acknowledge and anticipate that we will be faced with more unprecedented disasters, New York City must change its culture practice when it comes to working with communities and building for climate mitigation, adaptation, and recovery. A just transition rooted in equity requires us to rethink how we utilize and plan for our waterfronts for the future. Economic recovery means that we cannot afford for climate adaptation and economic growth to be addressed in silos. Decisions on land use, zoning, policies, funding, and partnerships will determine how infrastructure can either support our communities or continue to perpetuate cross-sector inequities in environmental justice communities. Sunset Park is New York City's largest significant maritime and industrial area, and we need the political will, investment, and support to use this waterfront to host thousands of climate jobs from New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, as well as the city's Climate Mobilization Act. In 2019, Uprose partnered with the Collective for Community Culture and Environment to develop a community-led proposal for um, Sunset Park called the Green Resilient Industrial District or GRID. The GRID is a scalable and replicable model to realize tens of thousands of these climate jobs projected from these climate legislation. To address both coastal resiliency and long-term local and regional needs for Sunset Park in the region. By training local residents in renewable energy, energy efficiency, retrofit construction and sustainable manufacturing jobs. The grid is a model of a 21st century re uh, green reindustrialization of an industrial waterfront that can be utilized for regional economic resilience and COVID-19 recovery. It is also an example of a frontline community-led solution to meet both local and regional needs. We are calling for the city to support not only goal setting, but creating real processes and investments of how to achieve a just transition. 
Um, they, I would like to thank the council for holding this hearing for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Thank, thank you. So you. Sorry, Chair Brandon. No, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Next, we will hear testimony from Daniel Gutman of the Metropolitan Storm Surge Working Group, followed by Tommy Bogue. Daniel Gutman, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Starting time. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Daniel Gutman. I'm here representing the Metropolitan Storm Surge Working Group, which is composed of scientists, engineers, architects, and planners who have come together to advocate for a regional solution to storm surge and sea level rise. New York City has not been pursuing a regional approach. The current plan addresses storm surge protection by ultimately relying on shoreline barriers, which would provide only piecemeal protection one neighborhood at a time. The authors of the plan recognize that these shoreline barriers would take decades to construct and are only a partial solution. For example, Mayor Bloomberg wrote that because of sea level rise, a storm like Sandy could cause five times as much damage in the 2050s as it did in 2012. If all of the 2013 plans phase one measures were constructed, he wrote, damage would be reduced by only 25%. All he could say about constructing all of the measures was that doing so would, quote, result, would result in, in an even high, larger reduction. So it seems that if a storm as large as Sandy hit New York City in the 2050s, flood damage could be higher than destruction caused by Sandy, even if New York completed all of the uh, shoreline protection projects envisioned in the current plan. At the same time, Bloomberg administration rejected after little or no investigation, a system of offshore regional storm surge barriers. But the experience of many cities around the world has shown that offshore storm surge barriers with movable gates are the most effective solution, one that could reliably protect the city for the next hundred years. But largely because of the uh, Corps of Engineers hat study, we know much more about offshore barriers today than we did than the mayor's office did in 2013. We also know much more about the city's shoreline barrier effort. The Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project, for example, uh, we found that the costs more than tripled since it was first proposed. And in addition, once constructed, the project would provide full protection for only a short period of time, only about 30 years. Because of the time and cost required to plan each section, protection for many neighborhoods, especially those in the outer boroughs, will inevitably not be constructed for decades. And uh, your bill 1620 is aimed at overcoming these disparities among neighborhoods and for that reason, we suggest that um, uh, the bill include a provision that would require the mayor's office to reevaluate the choice between onshore and offshore storm surge protection. And I did want to address one issue with Jessica Roth brought up about uh, gate closure frequency. Uh, Phil Orton's paper, I mean, the Corps of Engineers actually has a. I'm has inspired. A, has the, the plan of the Corps of Engineers would have a fixed uh, a time average between closures. In other words, for example, once every two years. Uh, and that would be fixed on average so that the, the closure frequency would not, in fact, increase as sea level rises. It would, sea level rise would be, have to be dealt with in a different way with, with small uh, barriers onshore, uh, not by this uh, off offshore system, which is really only for major storms. And thank you for allowing me to testify. Thank, thank you. you. We will next hear from Tommy Loeb, followed by Harriet Hershorn. Tommy Loeb, you may begin when the sergeant calls time. Starting time. Thank you. Um, I am a 45 year resident of the Lower East Side. And I'm here representing the thousands of residents who are opposed to the current Eastside Coastal Resiliency Plan, including thousands of NYCHA tenants. As you know, this plan was developed um, after the community spent years developing its own plan, which came in at a cost of about $750 million, only to be superseded with no notice 
and no planning with the community by a plan that cost $1.45 billion, including $1.1 billion of city tax levy funds. As you know, the council was not made aware of this plan and Commissioner Grillo publicly apologized to both the council and the community at a public, at public testimony. Um, the community plan would have only uh, involved destruction of about 30% of the park and the city plan involves destruction of the entire park, including 1,000 trees, and would involve raising the park six to eight feet, destroying the entire park. This plan was reviewed by an outside expert brought in by Borough President Brewer, who only had one week to review it. First of all, the city withheld critical planning documents, including the value engineering report, which allegedly gave the city the idea to change this plan from a, a sandy type plan to a combined conflated coastal resiliency sea level rise plan. Um, the, the city has never uh, uh, divulged or released this so-called value engineering report. And I would suggest Chairman Brennan that you also suggest because that was withheld and hidden from the outside independent expert. What we're asking for is a total review of this plan similar to the L train. As you know, when the L train uh, plan was reviewed, uh, substantial changes were made and incredible improvements were made, including the shortened time schedule. We have been told by the city that interim flood protection is not possible. This would be possible at a minor, at a fraction of the current cost, and you saw it being adapted at South Street. I'd also like you to ask the city, over 100,000 NYCHA tenants would have to be evacuated in a Sandy type event. There is no plan to evacuate them. And you should also be reviewing the $350 million plan currently going on on the Lower East Side in NYCHA developments. And when the city came before Community Board 3, they said they had no idea what was going on with that plan. That plan is redundant to the existing Eastside Coastal Resiliency Plan when completed. So this, this whole plan needs a lot of investigation. I hope Chairman I'm Brent inspired. will have a uh, hearing just on the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Plan. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Thank you. We will next hear from Harriet Hershorn. Harriet Hershorn. You may begin when the sergeant calls time. Starting time. Sorry. Um, I just want to acknowledge that I'm grateful and privileged and lucky to be alive. All of us have lost someone to COVID, neighbors, in-laws, family members, friends, Many of our neighborhood businesses have closed. We are traumatized and witnessing a changed New York City that faces tremendous challenges. COVID-19 is affecting all of us, but not equally. And its aftermath will be felt for a long time. Before the virus came to our city, the ESCR did not seem like a plan that valued people, that valued our diverse community. We questioned whether there wasn't a more humane, environmentally just, less wasteful, more honestly resilient and innovative approach. Our neighborhoods have been designated as environmental justice neighborhoods, which specifically mandates that low income, minority and other vulnerable groups are engaged and included. Yet for the most part, we have not been engaged and included. The decision to demolish the park, changing the plan from the big U design in which some of us were engaged and included was made behind closed doors. A charade of community engagement ensued through a Euler process in which our voices were ignored. Right now, COVID rates across the country are soaring. The pandemic is far from over. And during the last seven months, the East River Park has been a lifesaver. People flooded into the park, exercising as if their lives depended on it, but also to celebrate birthdays, to talk to neighbors, eat their free meals in the park, to try to feel a little normal. We talked to each other about COVID, about our city, and strangers spontaneously joined conversations with ER workers who were walking their dogs in the park before a shift, 
sharing news of progress and treatment with us. Neighbors told each other about applying for unemployment and we shared resources. We checked in with each other to find out who was okay and who needed extra help. At the amphitheater, Black Lives Matter rallies were held. Teachers taught English to native Chinese speakers. There were outdoor yoga, exercise and dance classes. There was music, children played and families had picnics, strung up hammocks between the trees. People found sanctuary. The East River Park during the COVID summer was even more NYCHA's backyard than it had ever been. And it was a mecca of social resilience, even more than it had been before. Destroying the park has dramatic physical and mental health consequences on the people who live on the Lower East Side and East Village. Digging up fill underneath, digging up fill underneath a large municipal park that may contain contaminants that could affect our lungs, cardiopulmonary and nervous systems, while we are all still in a public health emergency, does not seem rational. Cheaper, faster interim flood protection to our neighborhood would be more ethical. When the city of New York will be facing tremendous economic challenges, education and social programs are being slashed. My neighbors are experiencing food insecurity at higher than ever rates. I'm expired. There are more humane ways to spend $1.1 billion of city funds than to demolish a beloved park. Thank you. Thank you. If we have inadvertently missed anyone that has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, please use the Zoom hand function and you will be called in the order that your hand has been raised. Seeing none, I will now turn it over to Chair Brannon for closing remarks. Chair Brannon. Thank you, Council. Um, this was uh, a great hearing. Uh, it was deja, in some ways, it was deja vu all over again. Um, I think uh, eight years ago, we woke up to um, what we had been told was a, you know, once in a hundred year storm. Um, and we know that that is no longer the case. Um, and I obviously my concerns remain just as they did a year ago, um, that now with the added challenges and, and, and fiscal uh, limitations of COVID um, and what it's done to our budget, city, state and federal, um, there are significant concerns that we are not um, we are now not able to look at this in a holistic way. And we absolutely need to prioritize um, that we continue looking at this, uh, these resiliency efforts um, to fortify our, our 520 miles of coastline, that we continue looking at this in a holistic way um, and not in a scattershot approach. So obviously I look forward to the updates that the MO, MOR can provide us to see where we're at with all the different projects um, and the different funding levels and, and, and the different status updates and progress reports. Um, look, I think we all agree we need a citywide approach um, to resilience. And um, I think we're all on the same page that that's what needs to happen. Um, but unfortunately, I don't know that that's what's actually happening. And now with the, the added concerns of the budget restraints, I, I worry that we're gonna have to double down and push even harder uh, to make sure that the administration remembers that um, Lower Manhattan is not the only area of the city that needs to be fortified, um, and and that the 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 oil uh, that runs the economic engine of this city, which for the time being may still exist in Manhattan, uh, resides in the outer boroughs, and it resides primarily uh, on very vulnerable coastlines. That's made up of largely of uh, um, low-income communities and communities of color. So uh, we need to take all of this into consideration as we move forward um, uh, eight years later. So uh, I thank everyone uh, who worked so hard behind the scenes to put this, this hearing together. Um, and with that,